going to invite Amrita, who is our uh, curatorial advisor. Uh, I have a long-standing relationship with Amrita. We worked, when we started our work initially and we started this partner of master, Mohile Parikh literally kind of nurtured us and took care of us. And Amrita, without even thinking twice, said, we will go ahead and do this program. Um, and since then, it's been a long journey. I'm going to just share something. I never do formal uh, introductions, but I really think I need to kind of share what Amrita has done. Uh, so I'm going to read out uh, about her achievements. She is a historian, a researcher, a writer who's involved in art education, archiving and cultural management. She's been with Mohile Parik since 2002. She's curated a wide range of seminars. She's done scholarly talks. She's been part of panels, conducted workshops and exhibitions, and also been a large, uh, large part of her work has also been to do with public art projects. And she's also one of the co-founders of CASP, um, so, which is a, a council for arts and community-based social practice. Um, in Mohila Parikh right now, what they're doing is they're creating these films on art, which are about Indian artists and their work, and they call it video. Um, she's also a visiting lecturer at JJ School of Art. But what's also interesting is that she has her roots in uh, Shillong, and she's been working a lot in Northeast with all the educators. She's doing a lot of research. And we've been really fortunate that she's taken on the Gohati leg for our art education roundtables. And she's a curator who's planned out a very interesting one full day symposium, inviting everyone from the Northeastern region to be a part of this. Amrita, may I welcome you and hand over the mic to you. Good morning, everybody. It's so wonderful to see such a full house. And uh, thank you, Ritu, and thank you, Asad, for making me a part of it. And art education is my, very close to my heart, given the work at the Mohle Parikh Center. And it's, it's wonderful to be collaborating with like-minded institutions to take this vision forward. So uh, I think we'll have a very fascinating day today. And I'd like to uh, introduce, uh, we'll be beginning our first panel. And I'd like to introduce our speakers for the first panel. Um, uh, and the, uh, just to give a quick background, um, AER has happened in several places across the country. So that's it. the first one took place in Delhi, then Calcutta, Baroda, Chennai, Bhuvaneshwar, and we now come to the AER uh, Bombay chapter, and the panel discussion is the integration of art education, advocacy, and policy making for paradigm shift to take forward for what um, Ritu has been talking about, uh, actually working with systematic changes to bring about policy changes in, the, in, in art education. And uh, I'd just like to bring about the idea of the arts as a form of knowledge. And the sad part of a lot of the, uh, of the arts being relegated, uh, not at the core level in schools, but as, you know, extra classes and all of that, so which, is, which is really not done. Um, so art is, the arts not just, do not just transform the mind, they transform the heart and the soul, and the philosophical soul, uh, to, to take that point forward. So... Uh, so how can we change our philosophical souls for the future? And how can we use the arts to transform the future of our planet also? And it's a critical point of time and in history. I think these are very important policy matters because the children are the future of our, our planet. Uh, so I'll quickly go to uh, introducing our first speaker for the day, uh, Dr. Penny Hay is an artist and educator, research fellow, Center for Cultural and Creative Industries, senior lecturer in Art Education School of Education, Bath Spa University, and director of research, 5 into 5 into 5 Creativity Arts Research Charity. Her signature projects include School Without Walls. I think that's fascinating, School Without Walls. House of Imagination and Forest of Imagination. 
Penny's doctoral research focused on how we support children's learning and identity as artists. She's a member of the Creativity in Education Research Group, Research Center for Cultural and Creative Industries, Bath Spa University, RSA Innovative Education Network, Crafts Council Advisory Group, and visiting lecturer at Plymouth College of Art. Dr. Hay is also co-investigator on the AHRC Global Challenges Research Project, Rethinking Waste and the Logics of Disposability, Compound 13 Lab in Mumbai. Dr. Penny Hay, I'd like to invite you to a favorite presentation. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. So my presentation is called Learning Everywhere. Apologies for the um, very artistic invention of the text on the image. Um, I'm not going to dwell too much on the kind of theory necessarily, but what I want to do is to show how uh, this deep theory underpins everyday practice. So I didn't meet Tushar, but what I think I share is that sense of philosophy and everyday activism. Um, my PhD was about really observing carefully children's understanding of the arts, particularly visual arts in this context, but then to support their learning identity as artists. So I documented the same group of children over five years to distill a repertoire of creative pedagogy. And that's really informed a lot of my work. So I also run a charity which was called Five by Five, uh, and it's now called the House of Imagination. Uh, I called it, we called it Five by Five because it um, was five artists, five galleries, and five schools, but over 20 years. So my previous job was working at Tate Modern on the learning policy and teaching at Goldsmiths University. We then co-designed the approach alongside children and young people. So absolutely children at the heart. So my belief, like Bob and Roberta Smith, is that art is your human right. And I agree with the principles of this conference that we want to change the world. We want to change the approach to art education and really think about how we do that to develop creative, reflective practice. The principles of our charity, which underpin the work the charity is affiliated with our university, Baspa University, and I'm a research fellow in that context, so if I'm standing at a bus stop and people say, what do you do, Penny? I usually say I set up experimental sites for learning and research them alongside young people. So it's all about trust, everybody's creative potential, the process of inquiry, the focus on documentation and dialogue and companionship. So relationships are at the heart of our work, being alongside children in their learning. But there are challenges in the, U in the UK, particularly in England, there are challenges of prescribed teaching methods, limitations of time and funding, lack of provision for professional development, and a lack of critical framework. But with always with the notion of hope and action in mind, I think that together we can challenge that prevailing doctrine. We can create a space to explore alternatives. The theme of my PhD was that landscape of possibility. So the agency of children and young people is absolutely vital and we want to develop those creative reflective pedagogies together so that everybody understands why we're doing what we're doing. It's not children being done to. So I think we need to think about the culture of learning. This could be a maths lesson for instance, working alongside... Uh, my best thing about working at Tate Modern before it opened was that we had all of this space with and um, inviting children in to explore possibilities um, without the general public. It's great that it's visited every day now, but to th really think together with children young people about time and space and style of learning, and particularly the quality of attention and reflection that we engage so one of the radical projects that um, we've already mentioned is called School Without Walls. So a nod to the Opera House, um, my colleague. Uh, we took children out of school for a whole term, so that in our English context is seven weeks, and all of the learning uh, with the children was co-designed alongside their teachers, our artists, 
um, and all of their days were spent in the egg theatre, not at school. So we're trying to break down the barriers between school and cultural centres so that learning is everywhere. And the children were empowered to be engaged in real life learning, a living curriculum alongside professionals. I don't know if they have the same in Bombay, but here you can see on the right hand side, there's a schools inspector and the children had been engaged in a real life learning context exploring coordinates in maths and the woman turned up in a um, trench coat so I went up to congratulate her for wearing the right clothes for a spies game but actually she was the inspector <laughs> um, but luckily they got an outstanding assessment and in the egg theatre they have um, the top floor is a studio a uh, um, house of imagination and we create you know going back to the provocation from the young people earlier thank you very much that we co-design the learning with the children we create um, the structures and give children freedom to follow their fascinations in a hundred languages of expression a lot of our work has been inspired by the practice in Reggio Emilia in Italy but I'll come back to that later on maybe in the panel Importantly, this girl Tamara here, it's her fir very first day ever, not only in Bath as a city, but in the egg as a theatre. And we give each child a learning journal, so everybody keeps a reflective journal, and they record their experiences so that, that it's a place for um, reflection, so that we can see their thinking, their learning becomes visible, and then we can attend to it alongside them. Sometimes they work in groups, sometimes they work on their own. Sometimes they are taught high tech, um, you know, the processes of using different flexible and creative technologies. Sometimes they come up with the ideas that they, we hadn't thought of before. So here, paying attention to children's creative thinking, dispositions and competences, the children were able to co-design a map of Bath that um, they wanted to show that through paint. They put exhibitions all over the theatre, in the lift, on the ceiling, outside, on placards. They invited their parents and carers. They took over a shop. So their, their learning became visible to their families and they could see um, what, they, what inquiries they were fascinated by. And out of that work also came the notion of a house for imagination. So the, the shorthand for this is a um, a studio for children to work alongside creative professionals. So on the left hand side, this is the art school where Ben and I teach and the children are in the degree show during the art school exhibition. And on the right hand side, we've taken over a city centre gallery and um, um, our maths professional, Professor Alf Coles, has papered the gallery with um, graph paper and the children from seven to eleven are exploring um, deep ideas about maths and creativity and in this case endless possibilities infinity you may know sir ken robinson he's our patron um, if you haven't heard of him go and watch the ted talk our school's killing creativity so here he's launching a uh, the house for imagination as a concept at our university where the children have co-designed a marble run with our professor, Anthony Head, who's an interactive um, design specialist. And on the left-hand side, this is a co-designed event with children young people at Ridlington Secondary School, where they are Skyping children in Serbia, Spain, Rwanda, and in our case, Radstock, uh, to think about the notion of what is school, what is learning, who designs the curriculum, who designs the policy. And out of that idea, um, we wanted to engage the whole city in a conversation about creativity and, and imagination. So you may know Andrew Grant's work, who on the left, he designed Gardens by the Bay in Singapore. And um, this is a 500 million pound uh, large living gardens paid for by the Singapore government. However, he lives in Bath, he's local, he's a genius, and he doesn't have a big ego. So it means that we can work with him every day 
He's amazing. He's speaking probably at the moment or in a minute in England about this work. So it's quite weird that we're on the side of the world. But we designed the concept of the forest of imagination, inviting everybody to think about their own creativity, their own imagination, and exploring that with our students, with children, and create, bringing nature into the city to create um, inspirational and immersive environments to think about those things more deeply. So you may know that um, there's a large abbey in Bath. Um, it wasn't a religious project. The focus was on the environment, but we took over the inside and the outside. There was a thousand butterflies that Anthony had designed. That was an, um, a nod to everybody being different and that refugees were welcome. And also Toby Thompson on the, on the right, who left, sorry, um, who is a performance poet. So we've worked with Toby since he was three. And now he's 24. Um, and he, he should be here next. And then um, just to kind of give you a feel for that project. So each year, it's in its seventh year now, we take over a different part of the city. So we, we worked with architects and engineers to design houses of imagination that popped up everywhere. Um, and, and an inspirational, immersive maze where the children were... Um, allowed to play and draw and think and act and sing and dance, and a, a, a forest of a thousand trees that the children designed over four days. And I'm going to just end by asking Ben and Graham, um, my colleagues on the project here um, in Bombay, to just come and talk briefly. For a, I'm going to give you about a minute, given my time, um, and just talk briefly about the the lab that uh, you've created over the last year with Tushar. Sure. Okay. Very briefly. Um, I was going to do the talking because Ben came off a plane last night at midnight. and Although it's, it all came out of his PhD, so it started with him and actually in a dialogue with Tushar. So Tushar, again, is very much with us here. So it's an eight-year process this has been that came out of Ben's PhD. And we've been working really closely with Acorn Foundation, who's famous... Daravi Rocks percussion collective you may well have heard of and what we've been doing is incrementally building a maker space and experimental learning lab in the middle of Daravi uh, working with media audiovisual tools, resources 3D printing, fast internet connectivity, the best stuff we can get to put into the hands of young people there and the whole idea is that the learning that takes place should be drawn from the experiences, struggles, knowledge of everyday life, citizen science, citizen culture of the, that those young people have, including hip-hop, design, making, repair, recycling, all the things that is going. You could describe Daravi as a giant maker space. It's highly productive, massively, massively economically important for the city, not least in, in, in the amount of waste that is processed there. And we're delighted that Art First is running weekly art classes as part of the project, and the dialogue that's opening up with Art First around the project is a really important part of what's happening. But the, the core of the project is a series of artist residences which will explore the idea, the problems of waste, work, and survival in the 23rd century, working with those young people, working in those neighbourhoods. And there are four artists based in India and two from the UK who over the course of the next six to nine months are going to be working in residences there, from which we will develop learning materials, an exhibition, a hackathon here in Mumbai next year. Um, and there's a research process underpinning this project, very much based on the kinds of questions that Penny and others are raising about, about learning which involves Shiv Nadar University, Bath Spa and my own university, the University of the West of Scotland in the UK. The website is going live later this week, so you can find that at compound13.org and we have a Twitter feed at compound13lab and we'd be delighted to talk to you about what we're up to. Thank you. And that's the end. Yeah. Right. Ben. Ben. Just, to, just to add that... Uh, Graham, I and Penny are here all, all week in Mumbai, so if anyone is interested to learn more or participate or collaborate in some way, please do get in touch through our first. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you, Penny, for 
setting up the, uh, particularly the idea of the landscape as, as possibility, because I think it's a fascinating idea to begin, that's the crux of educating a child through, through the landscape. Uh, we'll, take, uh, we'll take up questions and conversations later. Uh, I'd like to uh, invite uh, our next speaker, Dr. Sangeeta Gole. Uh, Sangeeta Gole is founder partner of PEARLS, Professional Enrichment and Reflective Learning Systems, an education enterprise set up in May 2017. An educationist with experience in teaching and training both in rural and urban schools. She has served as the education sector, she has served in the education sector for the last 30 years in her capacity as teacher, headmistress, and education advisor to schools across Maharashtra, and also accessor across India. Her work experience extends across different types of education institutions and with government projects in Maharashtra under SSA and RMSA. Dr. Gole is a validated facilitator for British Council's core skills development program and has conducted all over, which has been conducted all over India. She also has a PhD in education, enhancing human resource practices in schools, and is committed to lifelong learning and continuing research on ways and means to transform schools to learning organizations. Dr. Sangeeta Gole, the panel is open for you. Thank you so much. Wishing everyone a very happy morning. I'm going to share my experiences and view as an educator and, like Amrita mentioned, had the good fortune to begin my career as a primary school teacher, then went on to becoming a secondary school teacher, then a headmistress, and then I kind of uh, quit my job quite early and decided to work in the rural areas and actually understand what is education learning all about. And then on, went on to becoming an assessor for school, researcher, mentor, and having played all these roles in the rural and urban sector, I have a lot to say. And I have so many stories to tell. But Ritu has given me only 10 minutes. <laughs> so in order to ensure that I don't go off track, I need my notes. So I'm going to be talking about uh, sharing my understanding about what is the role that principals, uh, you know, kind of uh, play in evolving and nurturing creative environments. Or what's the uh, effect of training and mentoring on teachers uh, and specifically on enter, uh, enriching our teachers' competencies. Um, what's the role of art in enriching uh, a school's learning environment? And what was the paradigm shift that happened with our understanding of applying pedagogy uh, to art training, visual arts training? I don't necessarily have an order, but I think uh, uh, you will find one or uh, mention and uh, me touching upon these areas as I go along. It's a well-known fact that each one of us has a creative side that may not manifest and lie dormant for many years. To enhance our personal competencies, we need to get and give opportunities to explore and enjoy the untapped potential with each one of us. In one of the workshops that I conducted as a part of my doctoral studies, the topic was to enhance secondary school teachers, all teachers, curricular, co-curricular as they are called, wanted to look at how the training was going to impact their personal effectiveness. So one of the activity given to 35 teachers was to relax, express their thoughts and emotions through art, through visual art. A soft ambience was created with music. And at the end of an hour, they had to share the outcome. And lo and behold, what do I see? What do you think I saw after an hour? 32 out of 35 teachers had created a village scene. Can you visualize the village scene? Yeah. The mountains, those uh, flying. Yeah? Right. There was one teacher who was creative. He, cre he made an Indian flag with a pigeon flying. Peace, he said. I don't remember what the other one did. I was too shocked. It hit all of us when we shared it all, that what has happened become of us. And so the reflection session was one of humor, and it was one of reflection. A standardized system of education has created identical prototypes. And therefore, ensuring and enabling ourselves to find our creative selves became the goal for each teacher in that room. My outcomes was achieved. Teachers accepted 
that they needed to uh, let children be and explore and give them opportunities to explore uh, all the creative challenges that were given to them. A few weeks later, the follow-up session uh, showed that the above learning had an effect on the classroom teaching learning process. So the pedagogy that was observed was really, really very heartwarming. Post-training and learning for the effect to be sustained, now it was the role of the principal and she had to create an enabling learning environment. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. So the entire goal setting that had been done got washed away a year down the line. But I believe that once in a while, we could give teachers an opportunity to use creative arts as a learning and development tool. A series of workshops on the same will be a refreshing change. I don't remember ever getting this opportunity as a teacher. It was only when I met Ritu that I learned that art and drawing are not synonyms. I found the art first curriculum so exciting that I wanted every school in the rural and urban uh, you know, belt to take it up. I became a strong advocate of the curriculum because I believed that students were going to benefit immensely from it. And I wish I could turn the clock back and go back to school where art first curriculum was being implemented. But one can't do that. However, we soon realized that there were major roadblocks. The visual arts curriculum was based on higher order thinking and it had to be implemented by the art teachers. Unfortunately, in state board schools and also CBSE and ICSE schools, there are hardly any in-service training programs that are well visualized and conceptualized for co-curricular teachers as we call them. And therefore, with whatever learning they come in, to the best of their ability, they implement. They have a syllabus and they implement that syllabus. Uh, Another unfortunate part is that very few heads of schools uh, are able to actually sit down with the art teacher and go through what's the curriculum that has been designed, okay? Give inputs or mentor and support this art teacher to kind of make it better or to add her own uh, value to it. So uh, that was the struggle that we faced that uh, how do we get art teachers to understand the importance of pedagogy? because classroom observations of art teachers showed that they lack pedagogical practices. Now we've been talking about pedagogy. So what is pedagogy? Pedagogy is basically the art and science of teaching. You know, when I did my B.Ed., we had this very, uh, we had this rigor of going through micro teaching where every skill was split. So whether if a chalkboard work, then there was one full day or actually a week of teaching us how to do chalkboard work. Then it was set induction then it was explanation, then it was questioning. And all these micro skills together then kind of equipped us to be competent teachers. Today we don't do micro teaching. So now you can imagine that when these basic skills of teaching, which is an art and science, is missing, we're going to have a lot of gaps and therefore reaching out to children is our challenge. And so we have teaching as very instructive and an approach that needs to be participatory and interactive is completely missing. I observed a class, and so it's fresh in my mind, grade two. The children had just come back from a short holiday after the Ganpati festival uh, break. So the art teacher walks into the class. The first thing he tells me, I don't plan lessons. I don't have a lesson plan to show you. So he was wanting uh, to kind of avoid a lesson observation because uh, the principal or the head of the schools rarely observe art teachers. So I said, no, but I want to observe what you're doing. So he was quite upset with me in any case, but now the troublesome creature is not going to go away unless I observe, you know, I let her observe. He said, okay. So I said, let me see what you're doing in the class. So he walked into the class and he said, good morning to the children. The children said, good morning to him. And he says, how are you? Uh, we are good. Um, uh, what, was, uh, 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 what did you do in your holiday? Uh, we had Ganesh Puja. Okay, so today we are going to draw Ganpati. That was the set induction. Then our man turned his back to the children. Then squares were made. I don't understand. Sharmila will have to explain that to me. And he made a grid of sorts and he drew. But the children knew about the grid because they were asking him, do we do a free hand or do we do a grid? And, uh, and this was grade two. So they had their rulers and pencils and he said, okay, you can do both. So that was the flexibility he showed me. So I had to, 
I had to rate him on that. So I go, I scored him on that. But it was not his fault. He needs help. He needs help with language. He needs help with questioning. So when we're talking about pedagogy, we're talking about fade-in activities, fade-out. We're talking about questioning skills. We're talking about assessment skills. We're talking about feedback skills. Because everything is good. This is good. No, this is not correct. This is wrong. That's all the feedback that the children are getting in schools. And that's where I think all of us as educators need to support teachers. I'm not, not seeing all teachers. I know I've met so many of you sitting here, okay? But there are so many teachers out there. Recently, we're doing a project with uh, MCGM where we are assessing their schools. And my God, they made a presentation. These are Zella, uh, one is that, and the other is a Zilla Parishad uh, project that is happening. And uh, about 30 of the uh, HMs, as we call them, headmasters, and their team made a presentation about how they're kind of, you know, helping children uh, to grow and nurturing them and the kind of syllabus they have and the challenges that they have and the kind of presentations they've made and the kind of colorful, uh, you know, kind of ambience that they've created in school. They've colored every school. And in spite of the limitations, you know, they have, they're coming out as winners. I think, Ritu, these are the schools that we need to go. I think that's where Tushar's dream will be realized. Thus, pedagogy uh, had to be an integral part of all our training sessions. And there were times when I didn't want to do it. And Ritu said, no, art and pedagogy has to happen. So then we developed modules on questioning, feedback, assessment. Year one was very tough. The art teachers could not fathom why they had to use different types of questions and questioning techniques and how Bloom's taxonomy was going to help them. They were disturbed and they were very unhappy. A team of pedagogues were trying our best to engage teachers. But the academician, I was not feeling good about it. I wanted to give up because I really uh, am not a person who is very well equipped with visual arts or this world opened up for me after I met Ritu. So we were struggling with the modules and we were not getting the kind of, you know, kind of, um, what should I say, interaction that we wanted from the art teachers. Uh, and I knew that it was not their fault and we were kind of missing out something. But Tushar is the one who understood the relevance of it all and he stood by us and he said he took it up on himself to make it a mission to get teachers to understand how Bloom's taxonomy is important, how developing questioning skills is uh, important. And we literally poured ourselves out on every side and year two then was a success story comparatively. Mapping all the pedagogical topics to the art curriculum made it easier to understand. A special mention our sessions with artist Sharmila Samant. They were mind-blowing. She blew away all our ideas. <laughs> she negated everything about assessment. And my team of pedagogues were frustrated that what do we do with her? But she was the advisor and we had to have her on board. But we all had to change our mental models. We sat together. It was fun. It was challenging. And then I realized that this kind of a process of curriculum revision through brainstorming uh, research, reflections, doesn't happen in schools. Very, very few schools have these sessions. So um, that's another area that needs to be worked on. We've been training our teachers continually for the last four years to develop pedagogical competencies, and we evidence very small change. That tells us that a one-time training program doesn't work, friends. A continual uh, you know, process of guidance, mentoring, tutoring is required. Because I realized that sometimes uh, too much of information overwhelms teachers. And when that happens, they don't know where to start. And that's where the role of the principal comes in, where she needs to understand what kind of training programs have the teachers gone to and how can we support uh, the other leadership team can support teachers to implement it and then kind of scaffold that learning. Otherwise, it just leads to transmission loss. Uh, in order to ensure retention of lear new learning, apart from giving teachers experiential learning, telling them the why of it is very important. Why we're doing what we're doing. Once the why appeals and the teacher's commitment level is at an all-time high. When an idea wraps itself around an emotional change, it becomes all the more powerful, it becomes all the more profound, and it becomes all the more memorable, is my kind of experience. Uh, mentoring, of course, helps uh, immensely. Now, uh, 
training is always a cascade effect because what we do with the teachers, the teachers do with the children. But there is still a lot of work that needs to be done there. Continual professional development is now taken up as a policy in most schools, and, but it needs to be extended to all the special teachers also. Competence mapping in terms of knowledge, skill, and behavior will be useful to determine our teachers, and we are kind of working on how can we profile, create a profile of our teachers. We've kind of doing some assessments with the art teachers to see whether we can profile them, but we're still at the very early stages of, of that. But one thing I think is art teachers are very skilled and they're very creative, but they also need to develop the art of storytelling. And that's, I think, an area that we've missed out, and I think we probably could take it up in this year or in the, in the next coming year. School authorities must acknowledge and practice that arts are to be given a significant place in curriculum and not just restricted to uh, being so-called entertaining and prestige earning activities. Uh, we've looked at the way art teachers perceive their role. They perceive their role as somebody who beautify the building, uh, the spaces, uh, the flannel boards, uh, uh, the, uh, whenever there's a training, the beautiful welcome signs. Uh, and of course all the rangoli that comes up and then those lovely greeting cards that come in you know uh, whether it's invites or uh, I think once uh, the heads of schools need to sit together and look at how do we kind of perceive the role and what is it that needs to be visible about the art teacher in addition to all of this I think that's when uh, new learning will will happen and um, I remember that any kind of learning demands theory building and I think as educators, we are kind of missing that out. And in this, I have found in different types of schools and teachers across Maharashtra and across India. When I've been training for British, with British Council for developing creativity and imagination as a core skill, theory building is a must. I have to tell you what the elements of creativity are, what are the characteristics. And I find teachers telling me they're tired after half an hour and they tell me, you know what, just give us a list of activities to do in class so that we are then, the message goes home and everywhere else that we are creative, we are doing creative work in school. And that's the struggle. Theory building needs to happen and I think art first curriculum is about theory building and that's also why we struggled in the first year. It's intense, but I think uh, intense is what is going to work. But it requires mentoring and we're all there to do that. When I say that the head of the school needs to provide scaffolds to position art as a mainstream subject, I mean giving the teachers the required time, planning their schedules differently, providing material resources, giving them the IT support, changing timetables, class timetables is important, communicating with parents about events and activities around art education, uh, joining art teachers during some of the training sessions. Very few school heads join teachers during training session, especially if it is uh, not an area that interests them. But I think that as a head of school, as a leader, I need to be aware of what my teachers are learning. Uh, and also interacting with the facilitators. I find that when I go to school as a trainer, I'm like, okay, a trainer has come in. But there's really no kind of uh, understanding and respect or interacting with a facilitator. That, okay, what did you find? What do you think needs to be done? Uh, are you getting the responses? How can I help? What's the support that I need to create? I have not had any of those experiences so far. So a lot of introspection and reflection for me. But principal needs to be an advocate to promote art education as a relevant subject, and we need to have that buy-in. Uh, the challenges that I see in terms of teachers' uh, competencies, competencies to understand and transact art curriculum is one. The process of assessment is going to be an ever-going dilemma. Individualism within uniformity, and I think that's the struggle that we had with Sharmila when we had. And is there a concept of good, better, and best? Is best the enemy of good. These are all things that come to your mind when you're kind of, you know, trying to assess students' work, whether it's curricular or whether it's uh, co-curricular. But we need to accept that artwork is not a finished product, but it's an outcome of the teaching learning process. As a society, um, uh, uh, we are into a big movement of creating smart cities, smart uh, students, uh, smart schools, but I think uh, we need to first create heart. And I think the Art First curriculum has the positioning 
and the capacity to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Sangeeta, for sharing your thoughts. And particularly I, from this session, I take uh, the, your idea, the last thing where we need to create heart, and the heart is where it is. Um, so um, I will now uh, introduce our third speaker for the panel, Shaheen Mistri. Shaheen Mistri grew up in five countries around the world and returned to India when she was 18 to start Akanksha Foundation. For 17 years, she has worked with teachers and students, building Akanksha to provide 4,000 children from low-income communities the kind of education that would maximize their greatest potential. Today, Akanksha serves 6,500 children through their school project and after-school centers in Mumbai and Pune. In 2008, Shaheen founded Teach for India with an audacious vision of providing an excellent education to children across India through building a pipeline of leaders committed to ending educational inequity. Teach for India directly impacts approximately 38,000 children across seven regions. She, Shaheen also serves on the boards of Akanksha Foundation and Simple Education Foundation. She has been an Ashoka Fellow and is author of the book, Redrawing India. She has a bachelor's degree from Xavier's and a master's degree from University of Manchester. Shaheen Mistri, I'd like to invite you to present your um, That you got to meet my kids today, but I'm actually even more happy that they are here today. Um, while Penny was, was speaking at Teach for India, we snap when we like something. Um, and Kushi turned to me and she said, I just feel like snapping at everything I'm hearing today. Um, and I think that's so powerful because for our kids to go back and, and take these ideas of art uh, forward is what's going to change things. So I feel very lucky um, to be here today and to have heard of um, all, all of these wonderful ideas. I'm going to go back and, and do a lot of, of research. Um, but really, the only reason I'm here is because I believe so deeply in art. And I think that's what sort of fueled a little bit of my journey. Um, I've been working for the last 30 years with children who have close to no opportunities to maximize their potential. Um, so the kind of children, 76%, who will not graduate from school, um, the kind of children, to borrow from, from Sangeeta, whose art teachers tell them, draw a box and then put a triangle on top, and that's a house. Um, and while we laughed at the, the references that um, Sangeeta, when she spoke about village, etc., cetera, um, how damaging that kind of education can be and that lack of opportunity um, can be. And so for the last 30 years, I've really just asked myself one question. For our kids with the least opportunities, our kids in low-income communities, our kids growing up with poverty, our kids who um, live with the greatest challenges, challenges that no kids should have to bear, what do they need? And as I've asked myself that question, one of the biggest things that I have found has changed children has been um, the arts. Um, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, that journey. It started very simply with us getting our kids to paint. Um, and as they painted, we saw that they collaborated. And as they painted, we saw that their imaginations came to life um, and that colors they were able to associate with their personalities. Uh, as we did this, we realized that something shifting in our kids through art. It's not just about drawing and painting, but something shifting in who they are. And then I went on and I started writing um, these little children's books um, where the star of the children's book was a crocodile who had uh, pink nail polish. Her name was Miss Mugly. But the great thing about the books was that they were illustrated by the Akanksha kids. And as that happened, I began to realize that through giving kids these projects with art, they are learning 
excellence and how to do something again and again and again until they feel really proud of it. And then through our work, we realized, well, something's going wrong in our cities where our high-income kids and our low-income kids are not talking to each other. And they're building these barriers. Um, and what's happening in our world where we're losing our ability to talk to each other? So we developed a project called Children for Children. And literally, we had our kids from low-income backgrounds run workshops for high-income kids in the city. Um, and you see an image from one of those workshops here. And then we said, why not bring some of India's wonderful young contemporary Indian artists together with our children? And you see one of those workshops here. And we actually got young artists to co-create canvases with our children. Those canvases were then auctioned. That money came back to fuel the program. And through all of that, we said, art has this tremendous power to bring us together to get us to start listening to each other, to move us from questioning and believing that we have and we have to give to those that don't have, to actually saying we have so much to learn from each other. And then when the tsunami hit, um, suddenly we went and visited those areas and we realized that children whose life had been the beach and the sea were now terrified to go to the beach. And so we created an art-based curriculum for children to get them to develop the courage to go back to the beach. And through that, we learned, well, art, art can heal. And then um, we became very interested in musicals, and we um, did a, a set of different musicals at Akanksha. This one was called Operation Kazana, and it was an original script about a group of kids in search of their potential. And we did a, another musical called Kabir and the Rangin Kurta about a little boy who seeks to come to Bollywood to become a big Bollywood star. And as we saw our kids grow and learn through the musicals, um, we realized that art, well, art makes us the absolute best versions of ourselves. And so really I grew up in my 17 years at Akanksha deeply inspired by the power of arts. And then 10 years ago, when I started Teach for India, I said, how do we continue to bring this idea of the arts at scale to more and more children? And so I don't know if you'll recognize Kushi here, but this was Kushi six years uh, ago. She's uh, much uh, older today. Um, but at Teach for India, we did this incredible project that we called Maya. And Maya was a, a musical. We actually reached out to a Broadway music director who worked with us um, to put up the show. But what we were really trying to do with Maya is say, how do we not think about art as something separate? But how do we integrate it into everything we do in education? So while we were rehearsing for our shows, for example, there was a, a monkey song in the show. And we wouldn't just do the song, but we would research monkeys and we would move like monkeys and we would learn monkey sounds. And so by the time we did the song, we had hit so many different academic objectives through art. Um, and that was a really, really beautiful and profound experience for us to realize that when you bring academics and values and the arts and the ability to express together, well, it's a very different type of education. And that the process that leads to performance can actually be life-changing uh, for our children. And I, I quoted the statistic, the kids I work with, 76% in the country don't even graduate from school and go to college. And yet the kids we worked with in Maya today are studying in university in the US. They're at the United World Colleges. They're studying in catering schools around the country. And really the confidence of that process with the arts is what 
enabled them to defy that this idea that your background determines um, your destiny. And so what we've been thinking about over these years is how do we develop more and more people? Sometimes I feel like this conference, well, you're already the converted, right? But, but how do we get out there and actually get more and more and more people to spread this idea of a holistic education? Um, Ruchi, who's here in this room, has been my greatest inspiration. Many years ago, when we realized art was so important, we started a, a parallel program that grew almost as big as the work we did at Akanksha called Art for Akanksha. And seeing just the power of what she as one person was able to do for so many people. Um, with Teach for India, we started a fellowship and as we got our fellows to ask that same question, what do kids need? Many of our fellows, after teaching for two years in these very difficult environments, went on and said, well, art is what our kids really need. So some quick examples. This is Jigyasa, who taught in a Delhi public school with us during the fellowship, and then started something called Slam Out Loud, which today uses spoken word poetry to get kids to express themselves, thousands and thousands of kids she's working with already. And this is Safdar, uh, who taught in one of our classrooms for two years and has just released his first feature film, which stars um, a street child in Kolkata. The film's doing really well. It's making its way around film festivals, and it'll be released here soon. And this is Shalini, who worked um, with us as a Teach for India fellow for two years and then started a program called Aftertaste, where she brings art to the mothers of our children in their communities. And she's worked now for the last eight years with a group of mothers to transform their lives. And this is Madsi, who was a teacher with us in a municipal school uh, for two years in Mumbai. And she started something called the Saturday Art Class, which takes art every Saturday into government schools and is scaling across government schools. And this is Tanvi, who has this ambitious vision and is building a nine-story building in Kamla Mills, which is going to be called the Museum of Solutions, which is going to bring the arts into a museum where kids can literally come in and design solutions for a better world. And yet, like the thing I wanted to leave you with is we need thousands and thousands of people, like the people sitting in the room, like the people um, that I've talked about on the screen, and we need them because really my biggest learning is that art facilitates voice. Um, the reason that I got Kushi and Mahesh to wake up and with their beautiful, Kushi's beautiful mother is with us as well, early in the morning and come all the way from Pune today was not actually to do that song with you. The reason I got them here is because I've seen how their lives have changed through art to a place today where they can stand up for what they believe in and they can stand up in front of you and say, there's something wrong in our country when we're not engaging our kids at every level of the education system. That is the power of arts. And so Kushi and Mahesh introduced briefly our most ambitious to date project, which we launched just a couple of weeks ago called The Greatest Show on Earth, where we took our kids real stories, um, stories of bullying, of competition, of abuse, and our kids developed the courage to tell those stories to the world. So I'll leave you with a one minute clip um, from that evening with the hope that one day you can come to see on uh, Kushi and Mahesh on stage at the greatest show on earth.
watchman in the dark is all soaking through the floor. And buried in your bones as an ache that you can't ignore. Taking your breath, stealing your mind, and all that was real is left behind. Don't fight it, it's coming for your woman. It's in this moment, don't care what can matter. Yeah, the fool would dream, can't you see? Getting closer. Just surrender, cause you feel the feeling that you're over. It's fire, it's freedom, it's falling open. It's a picture in the pulpit in your blood devotion. There's something bigger at the brick of every wall that's holding on. It's not Our kids, our kids were telling us that today education is this show where we tell kids, deal with it. If you get shouted at, deal with it. If you get compared, deal with it. If you get humiliated, deal with it. You'll end up okay. And as you heard Mahesh say in the film, he said, the show can change. The show must change. We mustn't normalize these issues in education, but we must hold ourselves to a whole different level of excellence because every single one of our kids is so precious. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to thank our speakers again for those wonderful presentations. And we'll have a few questions uh, which uh, we can, we'll talk about drawing from their presentations and then we'll open out to the audience. Um, I think there are three to four things that I have drawn out from these uh, three presentations. Uh, number one, that, has, that is a crux of, of uh, learning for, with children and for children is uh, landscape as, uh, as a possibility. And the landscape not just of a natural landscape, also mental landscape and how, how the arts can change uh, uh, minds and souls. I'm, in the morning also I talked about the idea of the philosophical soul. I think that is what the arts do, transform from the inside. Um, so I'd like to begin with uh, a question for uh, Penny. When you um, draw these, drew this idea of a landscape as possibility, so and also talking about participatory and immersive environments for children, um, of course you have collaborated with organizations and entities. Uh, but what about the using the real landscape as also a site for learning? So could you uh, talk about that, please? So the real landscape. So um, the landscape of possibility is a metaphor, but engaging the natural environment, I think, is really important. So one of the best examples I showed you was the Forest of Imagination. And the reason for that project was to invite children and young people to come alongside their families, their carers, their parents, their teachers, educators, working with artists, creative professionals to co-design a space that puts nature, creativity, and engagement at the heart of that experience. So at the moment, we, um, Andrew and I, the shorthand is he designs um, the forest of imagination with his landscape architects, architects, and designers, and I curate the learning, but with our students, our artists, our children and young people. So there's about 55 organizations that work together in a very flat level way. The important point about the landscape is that I think all over the world, especially with the climate crisis, we are uh, needing, we, it's urgent that we need to pay attention more to our natural environment and what we can do together to um, help um, support the, the, or reverse um, the crisis. I think, you know, only yesterday Greta Thunberg and many activists all over the world showed that pos that was possible, that young people are, you know, it's their future, it's not ours. So we need to do something about this kind of care and attention to the natural environment. So the arts exploring natural landscape, the arts exploring how nature is so important in our lives, I think is absolutely, you know, the, one of the headlines we should keep in our mind. 
I'd also like to ask you the question of uh, when you set out to, uh, the whole point is about the vertical learning systems and the horizontal learning systems. And I think the arts are about horizontal learning. So what are the kind of tools that you engage when you collaborate? Of course, it is about co-designing and keeping the child at the center, but what are the kind of dialogues that you have with across a range of um, institutions that you work with or a range of people you work with who are not, who may not be from the same, uh, you know, kind of context? So can you just throw that in that? You're asking good questions. Um, so um, and it'd be interesting to know your answers as well, but I think the most important thing for me is that um, it's not our project, it's everybody's project. So probably the first question, even if you think about the term curriculum, is what would you like to do? You know, what are your ideas? What, what lines of inquiry would you like to explore? Uh, what are you fascinated by? What materials do you need? Who do you want to work with? And I think in creating School Without Walls or Forest of Imagination or whatever our inquiry, it is that generous, very flat level democratic notion of if everybody's creative, we all can have a good idea and everybody's ideas are valued. So we co-create that together. So the tools of um, dialogue are absolutely, you know, a dialogic approach to learning, <clears throat> relationships, values, I think the environments we create and paying particular attention to the dispositions of learning so that we all understand and share that notion of creative thinking, creativity, and so that we make that visible. It's not just, creativity is not just this slippery concept. It's actually out there in the world and that art is connected to the way we live every day. Uh, I'd like also to throw some light on the reflective journal. That, that you all work with. And so I'd also like to un understand um, where does this reflective journal, who are the people who are reading it? Who are the people who are engaging with, him, with it? Are these, uh, is this journal going to schools? Is it going to other institutions? How, how is it being used? So that was what. Another good question. <laughs> so yes, importantly, the learning journal belongs to the child. So, um, with an ethical approach to research, we negotiate through permission. So inviting, don't worry, inviting the children to share their learning journal if they'd like to. Obviously the schools we've worked with for many years, so some of the schools we've worked with for over 20 years, and like yourself, we work with um, many areas of social deprivation as well. So 70% of our work is with children who um, I mean, the city I live in, one in four children are in poverty. So I think it's important that um, the journal belongs to the child, but in terms of a reflective process on their learning, with permission to share that, it's important to see that learning and also that it can become a diagnostic tool so that you can, in conversation with the child, co-design the next steps. So inviting the children, I think that's a key word actually, inviting the children into their learning, negotiating their learning, um, not being prescriptive, not being didactic, not kind of packaging the learning, but actually inviting the learning so that that book becomes that treasure box of learning. Thank you. Um, Sangeeta, I'd like to uh, throw open a few questions for you. So it's interesting that, uh, you know, your journey has been uh, through teaching and uh, also as a headmistress and then into policy and excess, excess assessment. Uh, so I'd like to, you know, first draw, um, get a gather insight into uh, your field work, particularly working with rural schools and, and how, how you're looking at the vast gap between the urban and the rural and what are the kind of strategies and tools that could be uh, that are implement could be implemented. In, in fact, when you talk about MCGM schools, I think yes, that, that's where you know we really have to go to, because already there's a lot of exposure in um, in urban schools and uh, high income um, uh, schools. But but I'm not. But of course, the arts across the board have to penetrate. So I'd like to take uh, answer ask you this: uh, How uh, what are the kind of dialogues you're having in the rural sector? I think I'm, yeah, I'm audible. Yeah. Uh, I'm having the same kind of dialogues in the urban and rural, surprisingly, because I think a school is as creative as the head of the school is. 
and or the leadership team is. And that's where um, uh, actually the, uh, what should I say, uh, that's where everything lies, all right? And so if I'm having a dialogue with teachers in the rural belt to collaborate, okay, uh, and learn from each other, use uh, arts as a medium for self-expression for themselves and also for the students, there's the same kind of dialogues that I'm having with schools in the urban areas. Uh, today, I find that children in, when, I, when I observe classrooms, I find that children are more empowered than the teachers are. Because children are getting, especially in the well-to-do uh, schools, they are getting a lot of inputs from different uh, support systems that the school has. So, for, for example, there's an abacus class, there's a robotics, there's something else. So, at the end of, or, or they're go, going for an art class uh, during vacation, or they're going for a, uh, a partner, the uh, master, that kind of a program. Now, students are more empowered than the teachers because the teachers are not getting that kind of climb in space to kind of help to, you know, kind of tap the potential within. Uh, very simply, I asked a, a head of a school that, do me a favor and just ask, give each teacher a day off. And a day off, not from school. She'll be in school, but just let her be in school and just observe the sights and sounds in school, reflect and see how does she now perceive school. What is happening with the learning environment? Let her just walk around the school, take rest, sit in the library, go to the computer room, uh, you know, kind of be with the children, not in a structured timetable, but just be. They thought that I was crazy. That they said, and one day's portion, I said, that can be. But the learning that's going to happen is going to be tremendous. Now, this suggestion was given to the urban and the rural. The rural head of the school took it up. So that's where, uh, you know, kind of the change is being kind of slowly noticed that uh, I think, uh, especially in places like Mumbai, we've reached a saturation point. Also, uh, too many people are telling the heads of schools what to do. And I think that's also uh, something that needs to be kind of looked into. Uh, today, we have reached a space where um, we're talking about intense lesson planning and, you know, kind of training before a teacher walks into class. You've got a new policy coming up day before yesterday saying that lesson planning is not important. So is there an alternative to lesson planning? But like she was talking about a reflective journal, I've been talking about reflective journal for teachers in schools. But we still have to see the light of that happening, uh, you know, in schools. So I'm hoping that with no lesson planning, we'll at least have a reflection journal. But Amrita, the same things are happening in the okay. urban and the rural. The, the difference is the teachers in the uh, rural areas are more keen to learn. Mm -hmm. And some things happening in this socio-economic political scenario that we need to kind of uh, check and see how we can support schools in the urban uh, areas to kind of break free of a structure. And like you have, a, a, you know, a, a class without walls, whether we can have something for the teachers, yes. you know, I, I, that's what I kind of think. Yeah, this is exactly when you were talking about, uh, you know, the teacher being asked to give, to be on leave and to just absorb the environment she or he herself works in. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of us don't do that. I mean, the, at least in the arts, and sorry, in the education system. I mean, I'll just give you an example of uh, when I was teaching. Uh, I well, I I studied in Shantaniketan, so that was one of the one first models of uh, using the landscape as a context for study, and of course, placing the student amidst landscapes. So there were no schools. I mean, there were no classes. It would mean sitting under the tree to to have a lecture, so that kind of a thing. So when I came to or I came to Bombay to teach, so I sort of asked my students at the JJ School of Arts, "Come, let's go out of the class and just let's look at JJ and what it offers and why are you looking at space? It is a colonial space. It has all the symbols of colonial art education. Have you looked at at that in any context at all?" And have you questioned what you're doing and what you're not doing in the context of that colonial con uh, education? So there was, you know, there was like, I could feel a lot of people staring at me as if I was crazy. <laughs> I mean, just within, the, within an art school to take uh, kids out of the class to sit in the garden within an art school was a problem. So that is where it is. Um, but um, I'd also like to uh, 
draw your attention to the kind of uh, tools that you use for your training sessions, and if you could share some insights on that. So uh, training sessions are very kind of uh, structured. Okay, so whether I'm doing it for a Quality Council of India uh, about what is assessment or what is a quality standard, then they are very structured. But what I have started believing is that after training, post-training, when I worked with schools as an advisor or as a mentor, I uh, believe in the concept of quality circle as a tool. So we, you know, kind of sit together, uh, the teachers pick up a topic, they research on the topic, and including myself, okay? So anyone who's leading it. So each one who's part of the quality circle researches on the topic, it could be anything. It could be student behavior, it could be bullying, it could be, uh, you know, uh, what makes me happy. And each one of us then shares. Nothing else. There's no planned outcome, okay? So there's just research, the discussion, and then we plan the next, next topic and we go ahead. And that has made a phenomenal difference to the mind, mental models of teachers because they know there's so much out there to, you know, kind of look at. Using uh, technology, so we have one of these... Um, uh, mandates for schools uh, who are going for an accreditation and that is you have to benchmark with other schools all right so now for a school head or the teachers to be sent to other schools uh, and the other schools letting their doors open is also another concept that's not happening you know schools don't uh, let you look at what their curriculum is or what their kind of planning is everything is very confidential uh, so to speak so um, to make benchmark visits is not easy it's challenging so one of the teachers in the rural uh, schools he used technology and he looked he studied the process of library and reading in different parts of the world and then he picked up the best practices and kind of used that as a benchmark tool. So uh, when you say, what are the tools that I use? I only give them a little insight or a creative idea and a suggestion. Uh, and then, you know, taking it forward. But as a tool, I know that I use quality circles uh, in a very big way. Or also using questioning. Uh, that you can ask me a question that bothers you. And uh, then... Uh, a discussion on it. Maybe I have an answer or I don't have an answer, but coming back to you. So that's the kind of, uh, you know, kind of strategy that I've been using so far. And uh, it's helped to mentor. Yeah, and that's helped to uh, mentor schools and take them forward. Just to reflect on a couple of things you said, because I think it might be interested, interesting in the UK context. Um, one of the strategies we're starting to use is to take a group of teachers um, into one classroom in an immersive situation and then the teachers are the, one of the rules if you like <laughs> there's no rules but one of the agreements is there's no judgment so we're not looking at the teaching we're just looking at the learning and together observing the learning and having that in dialogue then that feeds the teachers keep reflective diaries as well so my other job is I train teachers and all of my students at the university keep reflective journals. So the, the notion of quality reflective, critical reflection is really important. So I think it was really interesting that you have a similar approach. Adding a last point for the Art First training, we've used a lot of concept maps and mind maps. That has helped the art teachers understand the entire curriculum. And, you know, uh, uh, within a day or two, they know what that entire book is all about. And I think that's really worked wonders. Um, you've given a concrete example also of, of using uh, the concept map and the uh, mind maps. Uh, can you give an example of a specific art action research uh, thing that you've done has been implemented and what are its outcomes? So for, uh, with the art first, uh, we, we did an action research uh, on uh, uh, how can we enhance students' creative and critical thinking uh, for students of grade 8. And we did it uh, uh, across three different uh, boards. So we had a school, uh, ICSE school, we had a state board school, and within a state board, we had a private and a uh, public school. And uh, our art mentors uh, kind of uh, conducted the program and the intervention that was there. And at the end of it all, we found that um, the public school was the one that uh, actually performed better then, uh, and sorry, we had an international school also. But when it came to uh, actually results of creative and critical thinking across boards, 
it was at the same uh, you know kind of uh, levels so this myth that uh, uh, children who come from uh, better uh, socio economic backgrounds may probably uh, respond better to a curriculum that has higher order thinking of another level uh, was something that kind of was shattered in a in a way and uh, we've been wanting to conduct more action researches uh, from uh, year four onwards and that's the kind of uh, plan that we have i think for the next uh, uh, couple of years where we would be embarking on more such researches thank you sangeeta uh, shaheen i'd like to open a few questions for you i think the journey of akanksha is fascinating and particularly the kind of tools that you have used consistently that of listening um I'd also like you to throw some light on uh, listening as a conceptual tool. How do you listen to each other, and what it means uh, to uh, open out that dialogue across classes, across castes? I mean, it's such a complex society that we live in. So, can you throw some light on what you think about the listening as a conceptual tool, and also how listening can also develop philosophical souls? a beautiful question just before i answer that question couple of things one is the mcgm right now there's a new joint commissioner who's in charge of education here who's extremely open to doing anything so if there is scope to to bring arts i'm happy to to facilitate that um the other thing just on the landscape question i i suddenly thought about there's a beautiful tagore example of he was teaching uh in a small village school and it started pouring with rain and he got all his kids to go outside and sit in the rain and he told his kids feel the rain and feel the ground and this is what it means to be part of the universe you know and and so i think it's it's such an important point you made i know for me as a teacher there was a massive shift when i when i stopped thinking that kids learn in a classroom and i realized that like kids learn every minute of their lives as do all of us and how do we make that shift so um really appreciated that point um listening um so so i think you have to want to listen that's the starting point um and you just have to do it and practice it what we found to be really really effective is extremely simple it's getting people to sit in a circle i think the the power of a circle is very important um and it's just a space for you not to respond and for you not to judge but for you just to listen So one of my um fellows started something which he called a guftagu circle he worked in a an uh, a very low income government school in pune and in that circle he had the hm of the school a grandmother from the community a second standard kid the lady who swept the floor um and they would just come to share stories from their lives um and it was facilitated by two students who would just say something they loved about the story but there was nothing else um and i remember being in that space and watching the lady who swept the floor break down and she she said she said you know i've been offered six jobs that pay me more than being in this school but the reason i stay in this school is because the teachers here know my name and they look at me in the eyes and so spaces like that we found to be really powerful the second thing is i just feel like every time there's a conversation on education in the country i look around and see the same thing today included we don't have students in the room and i think that's what changes um and the reason it changes is because ultimately everything we do is in service of children and yet we don't ask our children like why do you want to be educated what kind of education do you want and how do you want to learn and if we did that like even in this conversation if we were asking children what does art mean to you and 
and, and how do you want to learn it and what role can you play in spreading it? This for me has been the big paradigm shift in listening to say let's not just bring children into the conversation but let's bring them in not as the recipients of our work but as partners engaged in our work. And we're seeing examples of it worldwide and how like completely revolutionary that concept is. In India, I think it's the most liberating concept because when we think of our scale, 320 million children in the country to give an arts education to, it's just fully overwhelming, right? But if we think that these 320 million children are our partners in reaching that goal, and as they learn, they can teach, I, I just think everything changes then. Um, uh, the common thing about learning in and through the arts is, of course, process, and process and immer immersive environments, participatory environments. So uh, when I just like to draw on the example of uh, the fascinating um, uh, project where uh, the children from low-income communities led workshops, you know, so they also lean about, learn about leadership tools and all of that, what it means. So what was, again, the dialogues that you all had to initiate and facilitate this, this kind of a thing? Yeah, I'm going to just give this question to Ruchi, if you don't mind, because she was the architect behind all of that. So. I, uh, thank you, Shaheen. I think it's really empowering for kids to feel like they have something to teach others uh, whether it's other kids, kids who, who they otherwise feel have and know more than them. Uh, I think at Akanksha, we found it amazing. And you don't have to prep too much for it. You know, you need to feel, a, like any of us, right? The minute you feel a mastery over something, you have the ability to go teach that. What you need in order to do that is a sense of confidence. And I think that mastery brings that. <laughs> and... Um, we did it. We did it with kids. We did it with adults. So we had our 12-year-olds teach 25 and 26-year-olds art. It was amazing. Um, just little things that they did. And uh, to just have this room of adults uh, with their jaws dropped to see the confidence, uh, what it did for children is incredible. Thank you. Yes, yes. I have a nice quote to um, add to that, which comes from Loris Malaguzzi, who set up the schools in Reggio Emilia in Italy. And he talks about, um, once children, this isn't exact, so forgive me, but once children perceive themselves as authors and inventors, their motivations and interests explode. And I think if we were to keep that as our mantra for education generally, I think intrinsic motivation and agency, I think, are important for me. That, that you know, two things that could, should underpin everything we do. Thank you, uh, Penish, Sangeeta, and Shaheen, for this wonderful morning. And thank you, everybody, for being such a wonderful audience, too. So we'll go on to the next level of the programming. Thank you so much. <laughs>